this morning if you'll turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew. And chapter number 5. Brother Mark was complaining that uh, uh, I, I, I wasn't sure if I was going to just kind of preach over the four Gospels like I did Wednesday night. And he said, you're, you're not going to bring more messages from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? So he was complaining. No, I was already leaning that way. I was like, you know what? We've worked all this way to get to the Gospels. It seems like a shame to just kind of skim over them. And so we're going to look at each one of them. But blame Brother Mark. It's his fault. Uh, but Matthew and chapter number 5. If you're familiar with this portion of Scripture, you're going to recognize it as the Sermon on the Mount, what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. This sermon lasts for three, three chapters. It is all of chapter 5, all of chapter 6, and all of chapter 7. Um, it, uh, it also bits and pieces, of, uh, I don't want to say it wrong, but it, it just, it's laid out here in its entirety. It just flows well, but parts of it are also in the Gospel of Luke, and I don't think he, can, I don't think he uh, has as much of it included in his. Uh, I, I always just uh, focus on, on this one. I, I don't study the one in Luke as much, but uh, just because this one is just, it's laid out there for you, it's in order, and... Uh, uh, I mentioned Wednesday night that Matthew is presenting Jesus as the king of the Jews. And Jesus, in this sermon, is showing you what the kingdom of God looks like. He's showing you, here's what kingdom principles are. And so if you'll notice in verse, in verse number 1, it says, Jesus, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain... And when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, and that's why we call it the Sermon on the Mount. He went up into a mountain and began to preach. He begins with what we call the Beatitudes. The next few verses begin with the word blessed, but if you'll notice verse 3, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs, there, here, notice this phrase, is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. Remember, he's the king of the Jews, and now he's trying to get their thoughts on the kingdom of heaven. Right off the bat, he's trying to get them to thinking about the kingdom of heaven. He goes on, he says, blessed are they that mourn. He goes on, verse 5, blessed are the meek. Blessed are they. All the way down to verse 10, it says, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Notice this phrase again. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There it is again. Notice in verse number 19, Whosoever therefore shall break one of, the, uh, one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. There's that phrase again. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. There's that phrase again. Verse 20, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And I'm not trying to get into all these verses. I thought about that. I thought about just doing the Sermon on the Mount, like all of it. Do you know how complicated this sermon is? It, it is amazing to me because Jesus basically does everything that any Bible college will tell you not to do. He basically, and don't get me wrong, I'm not against Bible colleges or anything. I, 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 I love Bible colleges. I love that they're training missionaries. I love that they're training preachers and helping them hone their, hone their vocation and, and their calling and things of that nature. But, I mean, he goes into just all kinds of different topics here. Uh, he doesn't have three points in a poem. <laughs> he goes into all kinds of stuff, really deep stuff. Like right off the bat, with a bunch of people who aren't really that educated. I mean, they probably knew some scriptures and things that, of that nature, but he goes into some really deep stuff. Uh, he may, uh, notice that statement in verse number 20. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness. What is the word right? What is righteousness? That's being right with God. 
that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now you can take that verse and you can go, okay, so we need to be better people than the scribes and Pharisees. We need to keep the law better than they do. That's not what he's talking about, though. I mean, that's quite a statement. But that's not what he's... What he's actually talking about is you need Jesus' righteousness to cover you. <laughs> that's how you exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees and scribes. Because we just got out of the Sunday school lesson where Brother Mark was talking about with Nicodemus, who was supposed to be, he should have been, a righteous guy. He should have been. He knew the scriptures. He knew, he knew everything. But he missed this part where you've got to be born again. And you get born again by meeting the Savior. By, by the Savior putting His righteousness on you. That's, how you. that's what he's talking about there. You talk, well, That's quite a deep statement to just lead off in, don't you think? And then he doesn't really explain himself. He just tells them how it is. He's basically saying, hey, look, the Pharisees and scribes aren't as righteous as you think. They're not as, as, they're not as right with God as you might, might think, people. And then he goes, he starts giving them examples on why. The very next verse, he says, uh, Ye have heard, it was, it, it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. What's he quoting? He's quoting the Ten Commandments. What are, what are the Pharisees counting on? Keeping of commandments. To get into heaven. That's what they're counting on. He says, Oh, you've heard, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. So many people want to read that and go, well, I've got a good reason. I've got a good cause. Last time I checked, if you are saved, then you are bought with a price. You have no reason for vengeance. You have no cause for anger. I find that, who in here struggles with anger? I've never met anybody that doesn't struggle with anger. To some degree. Every Christian so if you struggle with anger in here, I'm not telling you you're not saved. I'm simply saying, I'm so glad I don't have to be perfect. Because to be perfect, I can't get mad. That's what he's pointing out. He's going, oh, you, the Pharisees, they're so great because they haven't killed anybody. You ever heard someone say, well, I've never killed anybody. Good for you. You ever got mad? Because that's what Jesus is talking about. He said, you want to know the spirit of the law? You know what leads to murder? Anger. The first murder in the Bible, Cain kills Abel. Why? Because he's mad. And he let it get out of control. That's what he's telling. You, you want to understand the law of God? Here's the spirit of the law. Here's these kingdom principles. You want to impress me with your works? That's what Jesus said. You, you want to impress me with how good you are? I'm not impressed. You're going to need some more righteousness than this. And then he goes in and he says... Uh, you've heard it uh, in old time, verse 27, thou shalt not commit adultery. He goes into the two, what we think of as the two worst sins on the Ten Commandments. He said, but I say unto you, if you've even looked in lust, you're guilty. That's the spirit of it, he says. I've, I've, I remember one time I was watching this lady, she, she was speaking to a bunch of Christian ladies and she put a picture of a barely dressed guy, and I mean, he was ripped. He was ripped. I mean, he had all—you know—he had more than a 12-pack. You know, he had muscles that I didn't realize you could have muscles. And you know, and she said, "Look at this, ladies, isn't he?" And I thought, "Oh, right there, you're breaking the—you know—you're breaking the command, because the spirit of the command is don't even look in lust." I thought, oh, how blatant! We don't even real. We're not even understanding who God is. We're not even understanding how holy He is. That breaks the holiness. And she meant well. She didn't. She wasn't meaning to do that, but it kind of blew it out of the water. He he goes on. He says in verse twenty nine, and if thy right eye offend thee, you know this is right after the look of lust. Pluck it out. You're better off plucking your eyes out than looking in lust. Is what he's saying. Now, is he literally saying, go around plucking your eyes out? No. He's saying, you really... Look, if, if your righteousness... Uh, your righteousness is going to have to exceed that of the Pharisees. Let me show you what that looks like. 
Here's the spirit of the law. He's giving them kingdom principles. I'm telling you, there's not going to be any of this, this stuff in heaven. There's not going to be there's not going to be any looks of lust in heaven. There's not going to be any murders in heaven, or even anger. Anger will not be in heaven. And, and now let me also say this: God has a right to get angry at sin. He's perfect. He doesn't get out of control with his anger. He's perfectly under control. It's a self-controlled. Anger. What do we do when we get mad? It's always a selfish thing. Uh, we always want to throw a chair. Or, yeah, Johnny, stop throwing chairs. I'm telling on you. I don't think Johnny's ever thrown a chair. I think I threw a chair in the first or second year of our marriage. She aggravated me. And after that, it was very, very uh, embarrassing because anybody, anytime anybody came over the, to the, to, we lived in the trailer, there was this one little hole in one of the cabinet doors, and that's where one of the chair legs went through. And I didn't want to tell anybody that. What, what happened to your cabinet door? Uh, nothing. Nothing at all. Johnny, look. I can tell. Anyway, I'm getting off, I'm getting off course. Uh, and, and do you see how deep this chapter is? These are, these are really deep principles. It's amazingly deep. This is his sermon. And he's not, exp he's not really stopping and explaining himself. What he's talking about is he's, he's just showing them, hey, this is what the law looks like. This, uh, he goes on, he says in uh, verse uh, 39, But I say unto you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. What a kingdom principle there. That's difficult to do. That says in verse 40, If any man sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, uh, go ahead and give him your cloak too. Don't even fight. Wow. It's a pretty tall command, wouldn't you say? At verse 41, And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain, go with him two. Uh, he's talking about walking. He's not talking about driving. Uh, Brother Mark, can I borrow your truck? Ah, oh, I guess. I'm just, I'm picking on Brother Mark. I love Brother Mark. Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. And this is probably talking about actually carrying something while you're walking two miles. Helping this guy carry his stuff. It says, uh, verse 42, Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. These are some pretty difficult things to chew on, aren't they? Uh, he says in verse 43, Ye have heard that it, uh, that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Well, that's difficult. These are some difficult kingdom principles here. He's, he's, he's telling them, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is what it's like to serve the Lord genuinely. I have never met anyone who is measuring up to this. I dare say. I've met people who are measuring up to some of this. There was a guy who told J. Vernon McGee that he's counting on living out the Sermon on the Mount to save his soul. Wow. <laughs> I'm telling you, I've never met anybody who measures up to this. I've met people who are trying to measure up to this to a degree uh, as far as they love the Lord, they're saved, and they just they want to try to apply these truths to their life. This is difficult stuff. I'm so glad... I don't have to be perfect to get into heaven. Amen? Amen? I'm glad I have Christ's righteousness covering my sins, and that exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees and scribes. Because yeah. Jesus did this stuff. Jesus uh, didn't turn anyone away. Jesus, when they, when they slapped him in the face, he turned them the other cheek. <coughs> Jesus could actually fulfill this stuff. We have a pretty tough time. He goes on, he talks about not giving your alms in front of people. He gives them the model prayer, which is some pretty tough stuff to pray a lot of times, even for Christian uh, Christians. Uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That, that part is pretty tough to pray for even 
the best Christians I've ever met. I'm not saying they don't pray it. I'm not saying they don't mean it. I'm simply saying that's a tough one to pray, is it not? He goes on, he says, uh, you need to forgive others of their trespasses against you. If you don't, your Father in Heaven is gonna hold, isn't going to be forgiving you. He's going to hold that against you. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's rough. A lot of times we feel like we have a right to hold grudges and things. No, we don't. No. He talks about how, how you are to fast. How often do you fast? It <laughs> says, when ye fast. Not if ye fast. Verse 16 in chapter 6. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites. In other words, you're putting on a show. No, do it in secret. Do it in private. He says, uh, verse 18, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. This is all one sermon. That's the point I'm making. You see how many topics he's hitting? He's hitting everything. If we were listening to Jesus preach this sermon, we'd go, why is he? He's all over the board. I mean, people critique preachers. We do this. We're like, well, I didn't really like his style. I didn't like his tone of voice. I didn't like the level of voice that he used. He doesn't have a microphone. He's outside. I think he probably had to get a little loud for some of this. Maybe not. Maybe he just, in a tone of voice, and he doesn't, you know, if you hear me, you hear me. If you don't, you don't. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how, it, how that setting went. But, uh, I mean... You know what I think it boils down to? I think it boils down to actually the listener if they want to hear what he has to say or not. You know, Brother Kyle Jackson, when he was preaching, he preached on the parable of the sower. In Matthew 13, we're going to be over there in just a second. But he preached on the parable, and he, he talked about how it's really the difference in the soils. The four types of soils. One's hard-packed. One's got the... Uh, one is shallow. One has all the vines growing up, choking it out, and one is actually good ground. Really? That, I mean, that's what it boils down to. Brother Mark was pointing out this morning that Jesus had done a bunch of miracles, and everyone believed, wow, he must be from God. And then he sent them away, got away from them, because he didn't, he didn't want that superficial type of belief. He didn't want people getting confused. That wasn't saving faith. And he didn't want them getting confused. And so one guy that we know of, I hope more people, but one guy, Nicodemus, comes and looks into it deeper. That's a different type of soil right there. That's the, what were the other Pharisees doing? Oh, they were hard-packed. They were, well, we know he's doing these good things, but I'd like to kill him. You talk about hard-packed soil right there. You've got to be some pretty hard-hearted dudes to want to kill somebody who's doing good things make any sense. This is where he, he goes into uh, Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 19 through 24. It's laying up treasures in heaven. That's a deep thought. A pretty deep principle to get into. Uh, he talks about not worrying uh, from verses 25 through 34. Uh, don't worry about your clothes. Don't worry about your food. Doesn't even mention housing. Doesn't even mention utilities. Doesn't even mention your, your car payment. Doesn't even get into all the things that people worry about today that we that really are kind of necessary to, to live now. But he goes into, in this day, food and, food and clothes, those were necessities. He says, don't worry, I'll take care of you if you'll put me first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. That's verse 33 in chapter 6 where he's summarizing. This is all one sermon. You say, Brother Joe, why are you all over the place? Jesus was all over the place. Don't critique me. <laughs> You're critiquing him. In chapter 7, verse number 1, it says, Judge not that ye be not judged. That's probably the world's favorite verse today. 
He's not saying don't use good judgment in things. He's not saying don't be, don't be wise in how you deal with people and things of that nature. <clears throat> Uh, in other parts of the Bible, it says don't run around with the wrong friends. Aren't you going to have to use good judgment on that? He's simply saying here, don't be condemning. Don't be a condemning type of person. Don't, don't get into throwing stones. Don't be, uh, you know, ye without sin cast the first stone. Doesn't mean I'm going to go join in with what that woman was doing. I'm just not to hate her. See, I'm not to hate people. I'm not to get into... Well, I hope that person goes to hell. Well, I kind of just judged them right there. Well, I hope that person... Don't get into that. Because he says in verse 2, For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. If you are going to throw stones, don't be living in a glass house. So don't throw stones. Basically, is the point. Don't throw stones. Uh, it goes on and it explains some more things. It, then it goes into ask and seek and knock. Then it goes into what Brother Mark was talking about this morning where many are going to stand before Jesus and going to cry out, Lord, Lord, we've done all these wonderful works. And he's going to say, I never knew you. Depart. And then he gets into the wise man built his house upon a rock. The foolish man built his house upon sand. And at the very end of chapter 7, verse 28, and it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished. I can imagine. I'm looking out right now at, at some dumbfounded looks a little bit, and I've just skimmed over the surface of the, of the, of the sermon. I mean, it, this is a deep sermon, is it not? Yep. It's amazing, these kingdom principles that he's bringing out. You can see the impossibility of being perfect at this. But you can also see, man, I should be trying better as a Christian... As a saved person, as a person that's forgiven of my sin, man, I ought to be living that. I sure ought to be taking those kingdom principles and putting them into, into practice. But it, and it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. See, he's saying all this stuff, and he's actually living this. He's doing everything that he's telling them. He's, he's not preaching one thing. You know, I've heard Brother Bob say it a lot of times, you know, Pray for me that my, my life matches what I'm preaching. Because that's hard for fallible man. Jesus, though, is living this. That is mind-blowing to me. That is amazing. He really is 100% God in the flesh. So he's giving them the kingdom principles. Turn over to Matthew number 13 and... We're going to look at another aspect of, of him, of his kingdom, of his presenting the kingdom. He also he gave them a lot of parables. And this is the title of the message this morning: "Why speakest thou unto them in parables?" I really thought of that sermon on the mount. Those, those were tough things. They, the disciples could have taken them off and said, "Why are you talking about all this really hard stuff right off the bat? Why are you giving us these really deep things to to chew on right off the bat?" It says in chapter number 13, verse number 1, The same day when went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables. And so he's walking along the seashore, a great multitude comes, he gets out in a boat and sits down. How would you all like it if I did that? In fact, I've decided I'm going to start doing that all the time. Just, so I'm going to teach everybody. All right, the kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like that. Here's a parable for you. Here's a parable for you. I mean, it's not like he's going out necessarily going out of his way to, to... He's basically going, look, if you if you want to come to me, then come to me. This is who I am. I'm not changing to fit who you think I ought to be. This is who I am. That just That's always a principle with him. Why? Because he's the king. He's in charge. You don't make the rules. He does. 
He's in charge. He's the king. And if he wants to talk to us in parables, if he wants to give us all these deep principles in the, in the first sermon, in, the, in, the big, in, in this one sermon, he can do it that way. He's in charge. He speaks to him in parables. A parable is, uh, it's been called, this is a good definition of it, it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And this is where he gets into the, 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 the sower and the, and the different types of soils that I mentioned a second ago. But look at verse number 10, after he gives this parable. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered, he answers their question in verse 11, and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. See, the kingdom of heaven. I was telling them what it's like in the spiritual realm, how, 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 it, how we are seeing things spiritually. Verse 12, For whosoever hath, this is a deep thought, for whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Boy, that flies in the face of uh, the reasoning of our day, doesn't it? I don't have something, so I sh we should legally take it from someone else, and they should have to give it to me. That doesn't fit what that verse says. And what he's talking about here is spiritually. If you have the Holy Spirit of God within you, then you will you have. To whomsoever hath, to him shall be given. See, these disciples are born again. He says, I'll explain to you the parable. Those other people, if they really want to know, They'll have to come seek it. That's what Brother Mark was talking about this morning. The Holy Spirit uh, will have to woo them, and they will have to respond correctly and start looking into it for themselves. They will have to start seeking the Lord. He's not just going to throw his pearls out before swine, so to speak. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away even that he hath. If you're not saved, if you don't have the Holy Spirit of God within you, you will lose everything. That's, that's a good application of that verse. They will lose even what they think they've got. All their earthly possessions, all their even relationships and things, all gone. Their prestige, their honor, their, uh, their memory, all will be erased. It'll all be gone. It says in verse 13, Therefore speak I to them in parables. That's why I do it. How you like his reasons? <laughs> because they seeing not, or they seeing, see not. They can see physically, but they cannot see spiritually. <clears throat> and hearing, they hear not. Neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah from Isaiah 6, 9, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Boy, I've noticed when I witness to people today, it's like their ears are just dull of hearing. You can quote them scripture and they've heard it. They've heard it. It's like they've shut their eyes to it. They've shut off their ears to it. Well, I don't really want to hear any more about that. I, you know, it, It's like I'd rather just keep my eyes closed. Thank you. You can just keep that stuff to yourself. It just it, most people that I'm meeting, it comes across that way. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. Boy, howdy. Then he goes on and says in verse 16, But blessed are your eyes, these disciples, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. He goes on, he explains what the parable meant. In verse 24, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like. See where he's, the kingdom of heaven is like. Uh, in verse 31, he gives them another parable. And another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like. 
In verse 33, he gives them another parable, spake he unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like. He goes on and on explaining these things. It says in verse 34, All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet uh, in Psalm 78, 2, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus sent the multitude away, went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And he explained that one to them too. See, kings do stuff like this. They don't have to explain themselves. Presidents might. They get elected for four-year terms. Congress people might. Senators might. They get elected and all that. Kings don't have to explain anything to anybody if they don't want to. I'm glad he does. I'm glad he's willing to explain if people are willing to seek him. I'm glad. I'm, but, but don't forget, he's king. He's on the throne. He's in charge. Jesus, why did you do that Sermon on the Mount? Jesus, why do you talk to him in parables? Jesus, why did you do it this? Why did you do salvation like this? Jesus, why do you ask your children to do this and to do that? Jesus, why do you, why do you, why do you call us to take up our cross daily and follow you? Jesus, why, why did you allow this to happen in my life? Jesus, why did this go wrong? Jesus, why don't I have that? Jesus, why don't... He is king. He's in charge. He gets to make the rules. You know, if I was if I was in charge, I would have done things a little bit different. Uh, you know, I would have changed up the commandments a little bit different. Uh, that you know would have tweaked some things there. Uh, you know, maybe anger wouldn't have been such a big deal. Uh, things of that nature. He's in charge. People today think they're in charge. Burger King. There's your king. Have it your way. Is that McDonald's slogan? Or is that, that Burger King. That is Burger King yeah. slogan, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's their have it your way. It's God's way. It's Jesus' way. He is king. He gets to do it the way he wants. Have you come to grips with that? I don't know, sometimes that's hard. Sometimes that's sometimes we get some real curveballs in that area. He's in charge. You know, if I was Jesus, I don't know that I would... I mean, why teach them in parables? Parables are hard to figure out. Listen, listen to the... And there's multiple. I, I left out tons of examples here that I've got written down. Uh, verse 33 of, of chapter 13. Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. Why teach them that way? Maybe he wanted them to do some digging. Maybe he wanted to... I'm telling you, Bible scholars have, have trouble figuring that one out. But maybe he wanted them to do some digging. Maybe he wants people who will seek him. Maybe he wants people who will realize that he's in charge, that he's the king, that he matters. It's discouraging that not more than Nicodemus sought him. In chapter 3 of John... It's discouraging that only the, the, his 12 disciples came to him and said, Hey, will you explain to me the wheat and the tares? Will you explain to me the parable of the sower? The people were just... See, when the people are just impressed with the miracles and they like that he fed the 5,000 and things of that nature, uh, really it's a king who serves them. It's not a king whom they're serving. Not a king whom they're, they're treating. See, right there, they're going, I want to be king. I want to be majesty. Instead of realizing he's the king. He's the majesty. And here you have the king of the Jews who is the king of heaven. He's the king of heaven. One day, we're going to be in the kingdom of heaven. Why speakest thou unto them in parables? The answer is, the king rules and thus makes the rules. I want to ask you two questions this morning. Number one, are you one of his subjects? Have you ever been born again? 
do you realize that he's king? And that one day we're going to stand before the king. And he's going to be on his throne. You are not going to tell the king how that's going to go. I've heard people say that. Well, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. I doubt that very much. You are not going to give him a piece of your mind. He's in charge. I got to think, what would it be like to meet, uh, say, like someone of, of presidential status or like the Queen of England or something? Man, that'd be crazy, wouldn't it? And, and you'd probably, even if you're not all that big of a follower of them or anything, you'd probably still stammer over your words a little bit, you know? Can you imagine meeting the King of Heaven? No, no, no one's going to be arguing with him. No one's going to be telling him how he should have done things. Well, if I were president, or if I were queen, no, no one's going to be saying that. Everybody's going to be going, whoa, I'm, he's in charge. I, uh, how about we do that now? Before we get there. If, you, if, if, if you're lost and you're listening to this this morning, listen, he's in charge. He makes the, he's the one that determines how you get to heaven. He's the one that, that sets the rules on that. Listen, it's, it's, it, he's the one that said, hey, I'm going to send my son to die in your place. You receive that. You realize, well, I am a sinner. You agree with him. I am wrong with God. I need to get right with God. He's in charge. Listen, I, I don't hate Muslims. I disagree with how you get to heaven. I don't, I don't hate Jehovah's Witness. I disagree with them on how you get to heaven. I don't hate anybody. But listen, you've got to agree with God. He's in charge. Yep. Jesus is king. And he's not going to change that. There's no changing that. He's in charge. Are you converted? Have you ever been born again? Have you received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? If you have done that, if you are saved here this morning, then are you a loyal subject to Him? I know sometimes it's challenging. We read through a lot of the Sermon on the Mount. Some of that stuff's pretty hard, right? Let's be a loyal subject. Let's decide, you know what? I want Him to be King in my life. Jesus is King. I want Him to be my King. Let's decide that this morning. I want to give you a few moments, every head bowed and every eye closed to do just that this morning.